Welcome back. So we're looking at Ogun politics and they're jostling for the number one seat in the state. The, what do they call that state now? The gateway state. Gateway. The jostling for the number one seat is, mm, it's at its peak. All the parties are gunning who's going to occupy that state. And they're all campaigning doing one thing or the other. And they've all promised that, they're all promising different things. But at the end of the day, it all culminates to one thing. It's going to be a different Ogun state if I come into power. That's what everyone keeps saying. But would the electorate let them be? What are those things exactly that they are offering to the people of Ogun state? To help us understand what exactly is going on there, we actually invited the candidate of the APM, the Alliance for the ANN, the ADC, and the APC. But... Um, we have in the studio, and we're still expecting them all to come in, we have here in the studio Ademola Ogumbanjo of the Alliance for New, for New Nigeria, governorship candidate. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. We're still expecting Buega Ishiaka of the African Democratic Congress. He says he promised he was going to be here, and I understand he's on his way. We're also expecting Adekunle Akinla Day, even though they told us they are going out to campaign of the APM. And then Dakwa Biodun of the All Progressives Congress, who told us they are out to campaign. We're still hoping that they'll be able to make it here before the show runs out. But let's start with you, Mr. Gumbanjo. What is this that all of you are disturbing the peace? In quote, all of you are gunning for one seat. Why? Well, um, thanks for having me. I guess. Uh, it's because that it is extremely important. And I say it's extremely important because the agenda is to move a state that, that's been so endowed, a state with amazing potential, from the level of mediocrity that it's in at the moment to where it's supposed to be. Ouch. And I'll draw, I'll draw a line to what I just said and okay. the, the three ladies that were here. And one of them had said, oh, I went to Olas. It was an amazing experience. I had an amazing time. If I came again, I'll do it again. But my children study abroad. If the trajectory of Olas, quality-wise mm -hmm. education, had been incremental, do you suppose our children will study abroad? But she said they have a different father. See, the agenda is this in other climes, where schools are not left to rot away, where governments actually do what they're supposed to do mm -hmm. with education. There are transgenerational uh, attendance of institutions. Indeed. Great-grandfather went to the school, grandfather went there, father, father went there. Father did, now I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> and then my son is going to be on the waiting list and all of that. And then you hear them speak about what they've had to do for the school. And you've got to ask, where's the government? Erosion, we're trying to fix it. School bus, somebody bought it. Blackboard, somebody changed it. The foundation is uh, exposed. The chapel we're building. Mr. Gumbanjo, but you know that there are a lot of things demanding the attention of government. There are a lot of schools there that government and also government needs to deal with. Government can't do everything. Is, there is no new thing asking for the attention of government. We have had governments in this country that did what they're supposed to do. Tell me what's brand new. But, but hang on. You, um, since this dispensation, 1999, Ogun State has had a PDP governor and it has had an APC governor. You mean there's been no difference? It has been business as usual? To say there's been no difference means we're saying that the health sector, the education sector, uh, the infrastructure are still at the same level they were in 1999 or 1998. Mm -hmm. And that, that would be wrong. That's a difference. Mm -hmm. It's just not incremental. It's not, it's not a positive difference. It's, it's negative. Oh, Some mean, oh, everything yeah. is worse now yes. than they were in... Especially, especially in the education sector. Some work's been done on the infrastructure side, even though we have people, and rightfully so, who complain about the fact that the, you know, the, the infrastructure development has been you know, largely focused around a particular 
region. But you can also debate that to say, you know, it's the capital of the state, the state of power, you know, infrastructure must be improved at the center first. And then it filters, you know, into the interlands and all of that. So that's, that's okay. But I, I hear say to you, and say, I didn't have to come up with that story. That was a program that ran before I came on. And they've told you the story. And it's, that's not the story of all us. That's the story of AGGS, Abusio Admir Academy, Molusi College, Girls College, Sonny Luba, Mayflower, BBHS, mm. Abebuta Grammar School, Compro in Ayatoro. It's the story of education in Ogun State. And education is not the only issue we've got. So when you look at the environment, you can make a choice and continue to say, you know what, this is what these guys are doing. Let's just leave them to it. We focus on the private sector, create our own bubble, be safe, be able to provide for ourselves and the people who are close to us, or actually engage the process and say, how about those who can't fight for themselves? Okay, so now you've looked at, you've, yeah, you made reference to a segment that, and just ended before you came in. What are you offering? My agenda is to turn Ogun State into the wealthier state in Nigeria by 2025. How do you intend to do that? I will get to the how, but first I must tell you what we're going to measure. The wealth I speak of will be measured by revenue, human capital quality, and well-being. Uh, well On the revenue side, we recognize that revenue is a function of productivity. Therefore, the how. How do we drive productivity so that revenue can grow up, uh, can move up? We're going to drive productivity through two things. One, turn Ogun State into the food basket of the southwest region. That is, invest heavily in agriculture. 74% of our land is arable. Therefore, we'll look at yield optimization, seed, sorting, uh, seed, uh, seed sourcing, teaching the farmers new techniques on how to farm, investing in uh, fertilizers, and other infrastructure that help the process of moving produce out of the farm communities. That is, we must invest in roads as well. So as we're investing in agriculture, we must invest in rural development. And then the second layer to drive productivity is to industrialize the state along the lines of our natural resources. And we've got many of them. We've got gold in Ogun state. We've got bitumen tar sands. We've got rock formations across the state. We've got limestone. For cement. But you know, to even mine those, you need to get a clearance from the federal. Exactly, a clearance. We need to get a clearance. So what's stopping okay. us? What's in the way? Okay. You know, the first topic that we looked at this morning was um, polit political leadership in Nigeria. And our guests, a professor and um, an NGO person, the general consensus of both of them was that we need leaders who have the prerequisites. You just don't wake up today and decide, oh, I want to go to the House of Rep. Oh, I want to be a governor. Oh, I want to be the president of Nigeria. How have you prepared yourself for the position that you are asking us to vote for you for now? Interestingly, you know, there's a reason why people say management skills and then they say leadership qualities because it's not leadership skills. Management is something you teach to the mind of the people. Leadership is intrinsic. Leadership is of the heart. To teach leadership, you need to speak to the hearts of the people because leadership is driven by one, spirituality or philosophy. And those are the components that you, know, you learn from the family system. One of the main reasons why we don't have good leaders in politics today is because we expect them to be a positive unintended consequence. We don't train our people to be leaders. The family unit that used to do that is broken because it's under attack from poverty. So mom and dad are on the streets looking for money. The children are raising themselves. So now the value system is broken. We need to actively, if we want good leaders, we must raise them. If we want good doctors, we train them. Good teachers, good lawyers, we train them. But there are two fundamental things that we need and we expect good from that we do not train people for. One, how to be a great husband or a great wife. We don't train anyone for it. We expect them to pick up whatever it is they can pick up from their mom and dad and their aunts and uncles and then form their own. And then they attend maybe three or six months counseling in church and then they get married, voila, learn through the process. One of the reasons why the family system is broken, or fractured at least. The same thing is for political leadership. 
There must be institutes that train people. Because, see, it's not about experience, it's not about competence. A number of the people in office are quite competent. But it's about sincerity of purpose. It's about understanding that the people come before you. And when you see the way the governance is being run in Nigeria, you know that it is the people in government before the people. Unfortunately, the sad news is that the people are not even aware that they're supposed to come first. Do you take cognizance of that? Absolutely. It's the only reason why I'm running. Because we have talked to several intending leaders and we put certain things to them and we ask them the question, are you really going to be a servant of the people? Or are you going there to rule the people? I'll tell you what, there's really crazy traffic out there. It's why some of the other gentlemen are not here. You know how I got here when I ran into that traffic? How? I got on a bike. You won't be getting on a car. bike as governor, I promise you. If you don't get on a bike even before you're governor, it will not occur to you to get on a bike as governor. If there is a need to get on a bike as governor, what has changed? The office is the office of the governor. Ademola Ogumbanjo remains the same through time. But I, 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 Mr. Ogumbanjo, as the governor, will have uh, outriders and security, and men, security and men carrying their guns yeah, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Are I they going to get on the, on the Okada with you? I have the option now as well. People have said to me that they have concerns for my safety. They've offered me security. I have a retinue of assistants. I got out of the car. They drove down here. I got on a bike. I moved because I had a place to be. I'd been here before 9 a.m. Suppose that's, some that's people are watching and say, that's why we're not going to vote for him. That's fine. It means I'm not the kind of governor that they're looking for. They don't want a governor that can get on a bike. They want a governor that will bless sirens and say, clear the way, clear the way, you know. And the big man is coming. Yeah, you know, so we have a right to choose the kind of leader that we want. I am running because I believe I have been created for such a time as this. When created. our people have become so economically defenseless, mm. they cannot even make political decisions without consideration for things as basic as food. You say you've been created for such a time as this. Yes. Now, I let ask a question about how... In what ways have you prepared yourself for this? You talked I'm, about the I'm, fact I'm that... A well, I'm a well-educated man. No, you talked about the fact that we, people get trained to be doctors and lawyers. Mm -hmm. They don't get trained to be husbands or wives. Mm -hmm. They don't get trained to be... to occupy a political mm -hmm. office, to occupy any office, mm -hmm. as the case may be. But So tell us, what kind of training have you had to prepare you for this office that you want? When I was six years old, I was selling ice water at Olympus to in Obada Station in Jerubo. At six. My first, my first try, I couldn't afford the ice block. Because then it wasn't pure water or putting water in a bag and putting it in the fridge. No, no, no. You put water in a plastic bucket and you put ice block inside it. You cover it. You put a cup in there. That's a master cup, right? And then you carry three extra cups. And that's what you serve people with at six. I took my first ice block on credit. I took the plastic bucket from my mother. How much was the ice block? That's what was probably five cover at the time. Right? So you go sell, you come back, and then you pay for the ice block you took on credit and pay for the next one for the next day. There were days when I did two wrongs because business was good. And when I was eight years old, I moved to Lagos to live with a relative. I was quite rascally at the time. And then, of course, the, the discipline was intense, so I ran away from home. And for four months. Okay, hold on. Yeah. We'll come back. We need to hear this story of how you got prepared for this office. Okay. Please join us again. <laughs>